day. I think that we are... <laughs> uh, Dr. Chris, am I pronouncing your last name right? Yeah, it's Gilliard. Gilliard, Gilliard, so sorry. Gilliard, oh, no uh, who is a writer, professor, and speaker. Uh, his scholarship concentrates on digital privacy uh, and the intersections of race, class, and technology. He's an advocate for critical and equity focused approaches to tech and education. And his work has been featured in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Educause Review, Fast Company, Vice, and Real Life Magazine. Chris, I have been looking so forward to having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's like I, I've been admiring your presence on Twitter and really like the, the sort of dedication you have to chronicling what's going on with um, the intersection of data and privacy and race and social justice and kind of overall protection of humanity within areas like Amazon Ring uh, and recognition, sort of facial recognition. So I'm so excited because I think that you've done an amazing job of carving out this space. Uh, and so I wanted to dissect that a little bit with you. So how did you find yourself getting into that intersection of justice and technology? Uh, I mean, it's purely accidental, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I originally, I mean, so I, I have a love-hate re relationship with Twitter, um, as many of us do, and I originally got on Twitter just for, just to learn, right, just for community, just to find other people who were uh, interested in some of the same things I'm in, um, and, uh, you know, found a lot of them, you know, like uh, Audrey Waters and Frank Pasquale and and David Columbia and, and like tons and tons of people. Um, we were all like very cool and very gracious and, and very uh, open about sharing their scholarship. And um, I don't know, I mean, I just, uh, I'm, I guess I was on there enough that um, once in a while people started paying attention to what I said and, and I, I don't even know how it happened, it was purely not planned at all. But you ended up getting yourself a little blue check mark, which kept you off of Twitter I for a little while yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I had to go to my Twitter account. Um, it was, it was yeah, such a I, crisis. I, 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 that was pure. Um, um, there are certainly other people who are far more, you know, deserving, although it's <laughs> supposedly not some indication of, uh, of uh, deserves got nothing to do with it. Yeah, right. um, uh, but, sure, in many yeah. cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you find that uh, that surveillance technology, for example, was an area that was always a concern uh, for you, or is it something that, you know, as technology became more sophisticated, incorporated more like machine learning and things like that, that that you found yourself being drawn more and more into that area? Um, I mean, it's definitely always been a concern. Um, you know, I grew up in in Detroit, and the example I always use uh, is. Uh, there's a there was a, a a vice group in Detroit called Stress, which stood for Stop the Robberies, Enjoy Safe Streets, um, and there's been a lot of good work on that. But um, it was a, a group that of police and law enforcement that their job was in in their mind their job was to to um, clean up the city of Detroit. But basically, what it wound up doing is surveilling and, and profiling lots of black folks and. You know, um, by the time they were disbanded, I think had killed, and I don't know the exact number, but if like they had killed 14 people and 13 of them were black. Wow. And this is in the span of a couple of years. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I've obviously learned a lot more, 
Um, and, you know, so for instance, I, I will always point to Simone Brown's work, Dark Matters, that talks about the history of surveillance and, and black folks. Um, and, uh, you know, a thing, again, I think it's important to note that um, marginalized communities actually are no stranger to surveillance. Um, it's just that the technology has changed. Right. And so it's always been something at the forefront of my mind, but um, as the technologies change and become you know, more pervasive um, and more insidious in some ways, um, I think it's important to, to chronicle that or pay attention to it. Sure. Um, a lot of the people think this stuff is new. But it's not new, like the way it, it takes shape is new. Right. Um, but many of these things have been going on for hundreds of years. Right. I mean, it seems like you could talk about surveillance in the context of, you know, uh, and, and sort of corporate presence of surveillance or uh, citizen surveillance and things like that. But obviously now that you have the, the pervasiveness, as you said, of things like the Amazon Ring doorbell and you have, I mean, even just people carrying around phones with cameras on them all the time everywhere, which has, you know, kind of been a mixed blessing. Uh, right. We've, we've right. got that uh, constant surveillance, right? It's a it's changed the game for I think for human experience as a whole, but certainly as you say, marginalized communities are seeing the the rough end of that. It seems like right, absolutely. And I you know I think again um, a lot of times uh, I think uh, the 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 line that comes from tech companies often is about the you know say Facebook about giving people voice or if it's you know, Apple about, you know, the, the benefits of having a camera in your pocket. Um, but we want to be, you know, or at least I encourage people to be super careful about what that means. You know, I was just reading an article today um, in an interview with someone about Facebook. And, you know, the, the, the so I, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially, you know, uh, Facebook's claim is that their do is connect. Uh, and so they'll cite, uh, you know, and Zuckerberg has uh, many times, um, they'll cite the fact that the George Floyd video was, was put on Facebook. Right. This is true. Um, but it's also the uh, central organizing site for uh, vast swaths of, you know, hate groups and misinformation and things like that. And yeah. So, um, you know that, so... Which yeah. you just wrote a really great piece on Medium about uh, that the profitability of hate, you know, for for Facebook. Can you talk us through sort of the main points there? Because I know this big this big ad boycott was supposed to, I think, bring visibility to to um, you know this the ecosystem at advertisers and what is what's kind of. Uh, approved of and and sort of subsidized by the ecosystem and by what society says like oh we understand Facebook you have to have you know ads to support your business and all that but really the hate that's going on that's happening and, and is being pushed into sort of uh, more remote corners of Facebook because they're they're pushing it into groups and things like that uh, that's it's getting harder to justify and I think you did a really brilliant job in that piece sort of laying out the claims that are happening from officially from within Facebook, but also, you know, kind of the, the realities that, that check against that. Can you talk yeah, us through a little yeah. bit? So, you know, I was driven by rage, you know, as, as most of my writing is, um, you know, I was really tired of seeing, <laughs> um, you know, Facebook or uh, Zuckerberg or, or Sandberg or, or various other people, um, you know, who represent the company uh, spout sort of the standard lines, you know, about connection you know, as, as a good within itself, um, or, you know, the other line, uh, that they don't profit from hate. Right. Uh, and so I started out by comparing Facebook to a factory, um, you know, and a factory that not only promises to store, um, an individual's toxic waste, <laughs> but multiplies that waste and continuously, you know, disseminates it into, you know, the environment. Increasingly targeted uh, <laughs> recipients of that waste. Yeah. <laughs> and then later on, you know, after the, after much of that waste has been um, distributed, uh, you know, claims, uh, makes a claim that they've cleaned up 90% of it and, and thinks that that should be um, um, allotted. 
And so when it uh, happens to be the largest factory of its kind that's <laughs> ever existed, so 10% of that waste is still more than the universe has ever been exposed to in one concentrated amount. Right, right. And so the thing is, you know, and so they always say we don't profit from hate. So like I think that's a lie, you know, but <laughs> I can't say that in print, you know. Um but I think it's a lie. Uh but like even if you accept what they're saying, so there are things that follow from that. So if they don't profit from it, um, there's only a couple other explanations. They keep it up even though it's not profitable, right? So, right. I mean, so <laughs> the implication there is not good. Um, or that they are un unable to complete it. Yeah. Um, and we don't accept that in most other industries. Uh, you know, we wouldn't accept it uh, you know, we don't accept it for uh, food. We don't accept it for, um, you know, uh, car safety. Like right. we don't, you know, like there's there are very few things. And and the other thing is like they caused the problem, right? <laughs> and so, right? There's no industry I'm aware of. I mean, and, and again, like there's there's limits and, and weaknesses in this analogy, right? I mean, we still have. Um, companies that pollute and we still have um you know uh meat packing plants with all kinds of problems and things like that right i, I acknowledge that um yeah you're not you're not obviating yeah. those things by using the analogy though so yeah. it's, it's fair yeah. but um they cause a problem that um uh, that is of such magnitude that they can't fix it and right. so again so the the at least in my, um, the way I view it is if you caused, um, such massive damage to society, isn't that not like my opinion or something? I mean, like if we look at, um, Myanmar or the Philippines or, you know, recent elections or, you know, um, misinformation around the coronavirus or vaccination, right. you know, on and on and on, right? They're, they're kind of, um, uh, missteps or mistakes as they call them are well documented. Um, so they cause the problem, but they're, by their own admission, um, it's a thing that they're unable to eliminate altogether. Uh, and so, um, if you think that is doing something good, right, that the existence of Facebook is a good, yeah. um, like, like it's not necessarily a position I would take. Right. If you <laughs> I saw, saw that was a, that was a great uh, sort of caveat that you included in the piece. It's like, here's one argument that takes that apart. <laughs> I personally would yeah. not take that position. If good, then the question becomes, you know, what? How much evil are we willing to accept for whatever good they do? Yeah. Uh, you know, how much hate, uh, um, you know, uh, is how much hate is acceptable? Uh, right. And I, again, I got some people who commented on my piece, you know, and again, um, sort of <laughs> using that same articulation. Well, how many parts per million of hate, you know, would be acceptable? Wow. You know, yeah. like sort of, well, you know that um, there's a certain amount of uh, rat feces that's allowed in food. And like, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. People, you know? <laughs> people's gymnastics are very interesting. Uh, this, right? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, what I, what I find is really interesting about about the dilemma is that it, it's very easy to see how mechanics like outrage are, are part of the, the underlying algorithmic sort of optimization of, of Facebook, like, right, you, you definitely can feel that the things that get the most traction feel like they're the things that get the angry responses and the wow responses and things like that. So, you know, there's, there's already this, this capacity for outrage that's, that's sort of built into the optimization of the feed and, and what, what gets propagated. I think you just have to ask what is the difference sort of experientially between outrage and hate and how do you how long how many steps does it take you to get from propagating outrage to propagating hate it's not yeah. a very difficult equation it seems like to me yeah and even by their own metrics their own internal studies you know they um are uh i forget the exact number 64 percent or something like that and one of their own studies um, 64% of the people who joined the extremist groups had them recommended to them by Facebook. 
you know and again like it's a long list i mean yeah, it's really um, distressing. in terms of like uh you know uh, auto gener algorithmically generating categories like jew haters mm -hmm. i mean they like the list is almost endless of the things they've done um and uh yeah i and and so it's not even that uh again to go back to that factory uh, analogy it's not even that they store it right they multiply it and amplify it and yeah. um and recruit people to add to it Right. Um, so it would be one thing, you know, I mean, the old sort of publisher, uh, you know, uh, publisher or printing press analogy, which mm -hmm. is it's super faulty, right? <laughs> but like, it's not even that they just like give it a place to exist. They magnify it right. and push it out. Right. There's, um, there's no publisher that comes clo close to the scale, right? Like I come in my work, I approach the, these topics often from the perspective of capacity and scale. And and when you have the kind of scale that they have, you also have a responsibility at scale that has to be at least proportional in some way, right? Like so so that comes to the the topic of like regulation and responsibility. And you did I know um, we were just talking about uh, before we got live that you testified before the House uh, was it Financial Services Committee, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Last November. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you were talking there a little bit about regulations. What do you see the, well, first of all, I guess, what, what would you see as the threshold for regulations? When, when does an issue become sort of worthy of consideration of having regulations around it? Does that, does that make sense as a question to yeah. frame up? I, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, I think many of the models for this stuff are extremely broken. Um, and, and you could argue that they're not broken because they're working to the benefit of the powerful, which is what they're supposed to do. But um, I think they're extremely broken and that many of these um, products, you know, um, the, so the idea or so, so, and this is very simplified, but the, the notion that people should be able to um, throw something out into the wild see what damage it does and then you know maybe clean up some of it afterwards is pretty disturbing and faulty yeah um you know and again like we typically uh don't allow that in mm -hmm. other um in other arenas um or in the in, to the extent that we have allowed that society has you know often realized that's that was a mistake and done it differently Right. And it uh, seems like it has to do with how close we are to the experience or to, to sort of the innate understanding of what the thing is. Like food, it's very easy to connect with on a, on a you know, organism level and understand that we need safety and protocols in place there. Yeah. And I think technology just feels so abstract to so many people that it's hard to get, you know, kind of a, a consensus about where that threshold is where it starts to tip over into, you know, damaging or harmful, um, but at a consensus level. Obviously, I think when you're working in it and around it, as you and I do, uh, we understand that there's no neutrality here. It's not, it's yeah. not a neutral thing. Um, you're amplifying your own biases. You're amplifying, you know, the values that you have. But, but I think it's really hard to, to create the, the social discourse that sort of, that accepts that there's a need for for that, uh, for, for regulation. But, and then again, we've seen the Overton window move so much in just the last few weeks, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, and this is an example, you know, certainly we have a long way to go, but, um, you know, there have been many people uh, who for years have been saying that uh, facial recognition um, should either not exist or should be heavily regulated. Um, and for years, many of those people, uh, have been told that, you know, um, the horse is already out of the barn. Like you can't, you know, you can put a tech, you know, like once a tech is out in society, like you can't take it back and, you know, whatever, uh, formulation you want to use. Um, but that basically like that a thing can't be banned once it's been invented, which is patently false. Right. right? We know this, but, right. um, but, <laughs> but it, and, you know, um, not even a year or two ago, you know, many of us were being told that this was a ridiculous proposition, um, that it was had, had been invented and that there was nothing we could do about it. 
Um, but we're seeing different um, cities, townships, municipalities, you know, we're um, banned facial recognition. Right. We're seeing, you know, and again, however uh, pessimistic or, or uh, you want to be about it, we were seeing um, companies step back in some form or another from facial recognition. Um, yeah. We're seeing... For the moment. <laughs> yeah, sort of yeah, a moment I, in time. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, not at all. Um. <laughs> it was like this fleeting moment, like, oh, <laughs> is this going to last? Yeah, I'm not at all <laughs> like to, to congratulate or, you know, slap uh, Jeff Bezos on the back or anything like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're seeing cracks. Um, however small, you know, fishers, um, and, and, um, having some victories, uh, you know, activist journalists, technologists, you know, on and on who push back against these things. And so now we see a moment where it does seem possible. Uh, and when I say that again, like many people recognize that it was possible and have been fighting super hard to, to, um, make that a reality. Right, but I think right. more people are coming to the realization that it is possible and probably necessary um, that to think about some of these technologies as things that need to be, uh, you know, abolished, controlled, regulated, you know, however you want to think about that. But that uh, as a society, we're not just stuck, you know, once some clown like puts something out there, like we're not just stuck with it in whatever way that that clown decides that it should exist right like that's generally not how um i mean well i was gonna say how um societies work like um so we're seeing the ill effects that when society works that way like we're seeing um a lot of uh, the negative consequences of that and so i think yeah this moment which is like revolutionary in so many different ways I think that is an important um, realization that many people are coming to. Um, yeah, that I want to ask you about that. If, 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 if that's right, so it feels like the the moment sort of moment is what we everybody can, kind of keeps euphemistically referring to, like the the sort of window since George Floyd's death and and the Black Lives Matter protests and sort of the the rise around the world really of. A, a sort of consciousness raising in a sense of of like oh you know the anti-colonialism and and anti-racism and and um what's been interesting of course i think about about that is well as you said this has been going on for years the work's been being done for years but i think also that um as as i mentioned earlier you know the defund the police abolish the police discourse was was certainly present but it feels like that overton window has moved and that those those positions have become more defensible and, and sensible to people. Like there's more of, mm-hmm. a, um, of an acceptance that these are um, not radical or revolutionary ideas, or they are revolutionary ideas, but that their time has come perhaps. I don't know exactly how, you know, you might characterize it in the social understanding, but what I'm looking for is, you know, do you see opportunities to seed other ideas similarly like uh, to take advantage of this momentum and try to create you know sort of a social acceptance for other what might seem revolutionary radical ideas like the banning of certain types of technologies would you see yeah that I mean, um you know so I, i've said this before so apologies to anybody who listens to me on other things um but you know uh what i would say is that uh, I've heard a lot of people, um, and I, maybe less so now because it seems. So I've heard a lot of people say, "Well, what is society going to look like after the virus?" And I've heard fewer people say that lately because, um, um, judging by the uh, inaction of of many of wh- who are supposed to be our leaders, like there may not be an after the virus, <laughs> right, um, or it may not be for a long, long time right. um, in America anyway. Uh, but, uh, what I, I think people, many people do recognize, but what I encourage people to think about is that, um, many folks are actively engaged in sort of remaking society right now. Uh, you know, and, and, and some in ways that, uh, you know, want to sacrifice us to capitalism or make, uh, our lives worse, 
you know, in, in some very uh, concrete and specific ways. Uh, and so I think now um, that uh, without sort of sounding conspiratorial, like there's terrible people. Go ahead and sound conspiratorial. And things like that, right? <laughs> and they want to make our lives worse. Um, and so like, we are all kind of deciding um, in, in different ways. Where we're all kind of deciding what we want society to look like moving forward. Um, and, and, then, and again, it's not like we're not always doing this. Right. But um, this, this is a very, a time that certainly in my lifetime I've never seen. Right. Um, when um, radical, what we're seeing as radical propositions are now seen as much more acceptable and possible. Yeah. Uh, so whether that's, um, you know, defunding the police or whether that's, um, you know, abolishing certain technologies or, you know, um, I mean, there's lots of different things um, that, and ways of thinking that people previously hadn't accepted um, that now seem, again, not only possible, um, but desirable. Uh, and I think we have to take advantage of that to the extent that we can. Yeah. Um, it's a horrifying, and, I mean, just like, it's an atrocity. Um, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm trying to say this the right way. So the, the moment that we um, are for right now, like stems from an atrocity, right? Mm -hmm. It stems from the murder of um, not only one person, you right. know, George Floyd, but um, many others. Sure. And so I don't want to um, in any way, like George Floyd, I don't think, you know, I can't speak for him, but like he didn't want to die for this. Like I don't, uh, you know, um, Again, I don't know him, but right, it shouldn't it shouldn't take that for us to um, for society to change. Um, like globally, the outpouring of activism from this is a moment, um, and again, it's probably not even the right word moment, but um, it's a time. We've had to when, default to these kind of yeah, you yeah. know euphemistic terms because there really isn't a precedent for you know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Um, and so I think to the extent that we, you know, again, when I say we, what I tend to mean, right, um, activists, scholars, journalists, like people, anybody who's interested in kind of a more equitable or just society, um, it's a it's an opportunity to uh, push those ideas to happen. Um, because certainly the people who like want society to be worse are not resting um so yeah <laughs> yeah no that's true you, you know you talked about in the the uh hearing before the house financial services committee about uh the the problematic nature of algorithmic bias i know you talked about two concepts one was uh digital redlining and one was predatory mm -hmm. inclusion and yeah. I, I wonder if you could just sort of recap briefly concepts for you know people who are, are listening and watching and may not have encountered those those concepts before yeah so um predatory inclusion as i came to understand it um is mainly through reading the work of uh, louise seamster and uh i've only said this name out loud a couple times so i apologize if i don't say it properly um uh, Raphael Sharon Chenier, I think that's how you say it. And um, I don't know Raphael, so if I said it improperly, I apologize. Um, but I came to that notion through their work. Uh, and so I would do a terrible I, um, a, a job of defining it on the fly. Okay. <laughs> um, so I encourage people to read their work. Fair enough. Um, yeah. But the digital redlining is, is more uh, an area that you, you focus on, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and so just a little bit of background. I mean, um, if people aren't um, familiar with the history of redlining in this country, again, something worth reading up on. Um, uh, I think Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, um, does like a really deep dive into it. But um, there is also, uh, um, yeah, if you type in redlining, right? Like, far be it for me to encourage people to just Google something. <laughs> um, but there's lots of scholarship on, on redlining. Right. Um, but 
like having um, grown up again in Detroit, like it's a place where the um, long term effects of that are, are very visible. Mm-hmm. Um, people um, know have heard the term Eight Mile or, or have right. heard the of the place Eight Mile as it's associated with Detroit. Sort of like uh, one of the dividing lines between what's Detroit and not Detroit. Um, and if you drive along Eight Mile or or some other roads in 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 Detroit proper uh like mac avenue for instance is very clear sort of uh you know 50 60 70 years later what it looks like still uh, what the after effects are of um these housing policies um and so i uh i i teach at a community college and i i started to see through a lot of the work with students um some of the ways that uh those effects became digital, whether that was a lack of access to, to broadband or a lack of access to um, certain scholarly publications um, and things like that. And that, you know, there are a lot of ways that uh, these um, these things, right? So uh, lack of access to broadband. And again, like this was true before the pandemic, right? right? But has become more true. Lack of access to internet um, can be tied to... Um, health outcomes Mm -hmm. can be tied to, um, you know, uh, long-term educational outcomes or employment opportunities and things like that. Um, and often, uh, if you looked at it, say a map, um, uh, a redlining map of the city of Detroit and the suburbs or of Cleveland and the areas around it or of certain parts of California, Mm -hmm. um, that, Many of the ways that uh, um, these maps were drawn, like uh, redlining maps, uh, like those, uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, what would I call it, the sort of disproportionate effects of discrimination um, are still being felt by the populations uh, in those areas. And so uh, what I call that is digital redlining. Uh, And again, um, I call it that in part because people tend to chalk these things up to sort of chance or a luck or something other than uh, direct government policy, you know, something other than decisions by, you know, by platforms and companies, uh, right. you know. So, again, one of the classic examples I use, like, is the how ProPublica determined that um, – uh, people are using Facebook or could use Facebook to violate the um, Fair Housing Act, right? So they and um, I don't know if you want me to to. This is great. Uh, I, I you know this. Yeah. I'll just interject that you know to me this is really fascinating because you know my my previous book before Tech Humanist, my book uh, that I had writ- just written was Pixels in Place. And to me, this is a very pixels in place discussion, right? Because yeah. not only as you say is it that people would chalk it up to you know, just bad uh, government or kind of that, that sort of thing. But it also feels like people trivialize these impacts because it's just like, well, it's just internet. How could that possibly have the impacts that you're really talking about? But no, I, I think this this seems like a, a critical issue to, to understand fully, as especially as we get further into, you know, if, if we spend a little more time talking about, you know, the algorithmic bias and how that amplifies through um, throughout the dif- different platforms and systems that that we've looked at, and and how that yeah. plays out across the ecosystems of surveillance tech and uh, and facial recognition and so on. So yeah. please please continue. Yeah, and so I mean, again, um, if you just look up ProPublica and and Facebook and redlining, um, it'll pop up. Uh, but you know, um, a ProPublica did a really deep dive into some of the ways that people could use uh, Facebook targeting uh, to discriminate against people in terms of housing. Um, so uh, again, so Facebook, uh, their big thing is, is ad targeting. Um, and for some products, like, again, again, let me, let me say, first of all, I, I think again, tar- targeted advertising should be abolished. Like it should not exist. It's evil. <laughs> like, but, There's so your me, radical take for the uh, day, right. <laughs> uh, or maybe one of that. many radical stands you'll take yeah. today. I don't know. <laughs> but 
there are some products for which you might be able to make the argument that it's relatively harmless, right? Existing in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it doesn't, but but, um, but for things like, um, jobs and housing and things like that, it not only is severely problematic, but actually is against the law. Right. Right. (laughs) Um, and so um, ProPublica essentially found that if you wanted to, um, that it was possible to target, um, uh, say, a housing ad and have um, certain groups not see that ad. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and again, and one of the most pernicious effects of it or parts of this is that um, only so people don't know what they're not seeing. Uh, um, and so it took, um, technologists and journalists and, and researchers to find what's happening, um, so that I wouldn't know. So I don't use Facebook, um, but, um, (laughs) someone using Facebook wouldn't know that they're not seeing an ad for housing or that they, if they're a certain age, they wouldn't see an ad for a certain job or things like that. Right. It would take a dig into Facebook, um, by people who know how to do that to find that out. Um, and so what, again, so I would lump that under, um, what I call digital redlining again, like this isn't an accident. I mean, Facebook would call it a mistake. Um, but, uh, but I think it's incumbent upon us to, to realize that these are the products of decisions that Facebook made. Yeah. Um, and also, a severe lack of diversity uh, in um, in the in companies like them. I right, mean, I'm right. not. And, and it's actually I, interesting that, that relates to a comment we got uh, on the feed that um, digital redlining is a verb. Digital divide and other concepts that describe this are a noun. Someone made choices that made this, and that that feels like a really uh, nuanced observation that that there is this, as you say, this kind of active agency involved in the the process. Of, of that kind of suppression. It's, it's not an accident that, that those ads don't get shown uh, that, that to certain populations. It's not an accident that, you know, uh, that these, these divides exist, you know, they're, they're being put into place it, yeah, with, with yeah, decisions absolutely. that are being made, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and I think, and, and again, so that's a, a reason I, I find um, discussions about redlining so important is that, you know, um, why you know so people act as if um certain groups of people just decided to live near the incinerator you know or certain (laughs) groups of people just you know i mean (laughs) with no or you know don't know the history of how uh for so long in america the way general a a central way that generational wealth was accumulated was through housing right right but you know large segments of the population were denied that through government policy you know, and so um, by the time, so an example I use is that I, when I went to college, um, it wasn't uncommon for uh, my the, my people who are were in the same year as me or, or things like that. Like their parents might give them a down payment on a house or give them their old house or something like that. Well, there's a reason they were able to do that, you know, right? <laughs> um, and there's a or and there's a reason that it was much more likely that their parents were able to do that if they were white than my parents were able to do that. Um, me being black. Um, Understood. Yeah, sure. Do you feel like there's a parallel to within that generational wealth within housing to what we see within the digital ecosystem and technology, like the, the internet age? Uh, is there, a, is there a, a sort of landed gentry of a sort, you know, within the, the technology space within the digital ecosystem that you have you seen that as you apply the concept of digital redlining? Well, it's not unrelated in that. I mean, if you think about who they tend to hire, right. um, you know, or what schools they tend to hire from, uh, for instance, um, and something just came out with Facebook's hiring numbers. And I'm not, you know, I pick on Facebook because they're one of the biggest and, and easily, you know, it's easy. Right, <laughs> and right. I can't pick on them, right? I'm one person and it's a multi billion dollar company. But <laughs> like I use them as an example often because but it's not confined to them. I mean Uber or Lyft or Airbnb or Twitter or, you know, whoever 
you can insert whoever you want in there. And I, and I actually um, want to get to that because I, I think it's important that we do kind of look at the parallels across these different platforms and technologies. But but continue with your thought, please. I think you're, you're yeah. on to a really important point there. I mean, something... Oh, gosh, I wish I had it right in front of me. I don't know the exact number. Um, but they're, you know, Facebook just released their diversity numbers. And um, so I, I just posted about this on Twitter not too long ago, maybe yesterday. And the headline so said someone can like, grab that off of hypervisible yeah. Twitter feed and just post it in the comments yeah. and we'll see it. We'll have it in real time. That would be great. <laughs> the headline said something like Facebook inching towards their diversity goals. And they had gone yeah. from, you know, like 4% to 5% <laughs> or something like that, you know. Um, and over time, they've, they've um, offered many different excuses for why their diversity numbers are what they are, mm -hmm. you know, including, like, blaming it on, on um, like, a pipeline issue and things like that. Of course. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, it's always amazing that these companies – um, who, on the one hand, want us to believe that they can achieve the impossible, right, through code. But on the other hand, it's like, so it's like super impossible to like find black people who can work here, <laughs> you know, right? Like that's <laughs> right. Right. No, it, it's an important lie to, to surface. I, and I, so, but I, I also am interested in, in, you know, as we mentioned, kind of looking at not just I, I think you're right it is easy to to use Facebook as the example of all that is bad and unholy uh, but you know we, we know that there's so many other uh, examples too of of this kind of um, algorithmic bias and the kind of scale even that's affecting people um, in their daily lives like I know you talk a lot and you even had your username at one point on Twitter reflecting the uh, the Amazon ring doorbell like one yeah, ring doorbell yeah. to rule them all I think was what mm -hmm. you had for a while yeah. uh, so there is it seems to me there's this whole ecosystem of um, Amazon uh, their recognition algorithm you know sort of facial mm -hmm. recognition uh, package and then the ring doorbell so that's that's distributing through the internet of things you know into consumer hands the surveillance technology that that's feeding a whole bunch of, of uh, resource reference information back into you know the, the system and then yeah. uh, next door uh, which I know there have been partnerships yeah. right like with that company and with the um, the weird dynamics uh, that so take place socially within that the, the, the sort of carroting uh, that takes place on, on next door. Right. Is yeah. there more, is there more to that ecosystem that I'm, I'm overlooking? Well, I mean, gosh, like how much time do you have? <laughs> you know? I mean, there's, there's clear, you know, oh, yeah. Thomson Reuters, you know, Motorola's in this, you know, Axon, um, you know, uh, Vigilant Solutions, you know, I mean, uh, Palantir, uh, you know, again, um, it's a long, long list. Uh, and, you know, the there's some weird carve-outs. And again, weird as, as if it wasn't planned, right? Um, there are a lot of carve-outs so that um, private companies are allowed to do things that um, some law enforcement are not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. But then law enforcement that can then go to the private company and just um, purchase that information. Right. Uh, and so, or even, yeah, if we, if we talk about ring, um, and neighbors and next door who have actively cultivated, um, these relationships, mm -hmm. um, not only have sort of a consumer facing product, um, but to make the, the connection or the a access to law enforcement, uh, you know, friction. Have a, I think a little latency in the feed there, but uh, hopefully we'll get you. These companies come out. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. We yeah we had, I think we had a little a little hiccup, but we're good. We're back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, that these companies have come out with statements about, like Nextdoor came out with a uh, their Black Lives statement, um, which I think, and I wrote something on this um, too. Uh, which I, I've taken to calling black power washing, um, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, where companies uh, 
say that they stand with the black community uh, and I don't really know what they think that means. Um, but they're the products themselves are, are products that, that undermine that every step of the way. Um, you know, I think next door being an example that, uh, and again, much like Facebook, you could point to some positive things that have come from next door, but at its root, it's a, it's a snitch app, right? right? It's a it's an app that, um, or a platform is to people's anxieties about who should and shouldn't be in their neighborhoods and what kinds of activities they think are, are, um, like acceptable right, or not acceptable, acceptable in right. neighborhoods and to, um, make the connection between that and local law enforcement, you know, super easy. Uh, and you know, it's not hyperbolic to say that this is endangering, um, the lives of, of black folks and, and brown folks. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it, it just seems like it's a really important concept for, for pe- more people to have an understanding of. Cause I feel like that, that is not, uh, I, I, if the conversation reaches the masses about algorithmic bias and and about the the um, surveillance technology, it feels like mostly it's about um, very abstract applications of AI and and mm-hmm. facial recognition. Like people don't necessarily tie it to the doorbell that they bought that they love and that you know gives them updates of of who's delivering packages and when or whatever yeah like, they don't necessarily make that connection so I, th- I think it's a really a really clear uh, important um relationship to draw but it also feels like there's there's even more right like when we think about i mean even twitter which you and i both actively use uh and and google which you know we're sort of offhandedly sending people to to go search uh for for research um there there's there's always going to be some compl- complexity and com- complication to the relationship between what that technology is doing at scale and how it, it affects the populations who use it right is that a yeah, thing to say absolutely and and again um uh i haven't mentioned this but if people haven't read algorithms of oppression by Sophia Noble. They should she just that. agreed to be a guest on the show, so she'll be on here in a few weeks. Yeah. 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 So, um, but and so part of the a big part of the problem, unfortunately, though, is that um, a lot of these effects are they 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 are they are invisible. They are um, disproportionately or disparately impact um, marginalized populations. So. It's hard to, uh, so I, I have talked, spoken, and written about Ring and, you know, Amazon Ring a lot. Mm-hmm. Part of the problem with, with talking about it is that most people, right, and this is pre-pandemic and, and through, um, many people who would invest in a Ring, um, and, uh, you know, I'll just be explicit about this, many white people would invest uh-huh. in a Ring. Um, only think of law enforcement in terms of a, a institution or body that works for them. Yeah. Never as one that's going to work against them. Sure. Um, and so it's very hard. And so what I'm, what, and so they place, uh, often place the safety of their packages as more important than the safety of black lives. Um, yeah, that's so a great I statement. That formulation, right? Right. I mean, yeah. but, but many people, even even if you um, explicitly ask them, like they would still say, "Well, I need to get, you know, whatever product it is, you know." Um, and so, until that changes, um, there, um, until we can get that formulation to change, um, some of these probably aren't going to change. Um, and I, I realize that's a very pessimistic statement. <laughs> that's okay. You're talking to the the optimistic futurist, so we'll balance each other out a little bit. Well, and that leads me to, I guess, you know, as we're sort of wrapping into uh, a, an hour time frame, I want to make sure we're we're sort of summarizing some of this for for folks. Do you feel like uh, there are technologies that you are optimistic about in terms of the the impact that they can have at scale, and and what would those be? Oh. So my short answer is no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, and so the, the problem is, uh, um, or the way I approach it, right, is I think that scale, um, what would be the right way to say this? Scale in itself uh, creates many of the problems that 
um, we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's Facebook be having being too big to eliminate hate from their platform, mm -hmm. even if they want mm -hmm. to, or you know, before. Um, so if we talk about neighbors or next door or something like that, right? If I saw someone driving down my street or riding their bike or selling water or something like that, and I didn't think that they should be doing that, uh, I didn't have the ability to broadcast that to everyone in my zip code. Um, so many of these things, because like the sheer scale and scope of them, actually um, magnify whatever was problematic behavior to begin with, um, and also creates uh, a lack of um, the ability or um, incentive to police it, not, and not the right word, right, but to to um, um, to monitor it in ways that would keep people safe. So, and the other thing is that um, I'm very wary of the notion that we can take some of these tools and just point them in the other direction, and they're going to um, all of a sudden be in service of not power. Right. You know? right. Um, <laughs> I mean, body cams being being an example, right? It's a, it's a great example. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I I think that the, that scale is in itself often a big part of the problem um, because it um, the notion of growth, right, and the the um, and also that most of these companies. Uh, I'm sorry, there's like not a short answer to this. No, and, it, there isn't a short answer. I mean, yeah. even what like, and, and I'll just interject that, you know, when, when I'm, you know, talking about the, the framework of optimism, it's about work. Like the, the yeah. idea that if you, if you can see something can be better, that you're ethically obligated to make it better. And, and that's, that's not a way of letting people off the hook or letting platforms off the hook and saying like, oh, we can change the direction and, you know, sail it toward something that's positive and, and everything will be all wonderful because we have, you know, we're, we're amplifying human issues and humans are yeah. inherently flawed, right? Like we have those, we have those problems and our, and our society has those problems. The systems we've yeah. built have those problems. So we're going to have those yeah. problems. But I yeah. think the, the work of someone like you, I, I hope that my work is helping contribute to, you know, a, a wider uh, awareness of, of some of this. And I think it's, it's really important that, that we have these kinds of conversations. By the way, one of the comments we got is, uh, I know Chris is going to say something good when he says, I don't know how to say this. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. I think it's so true. You've said some very profound, powerful things uh, during this discussion. So are there, are there uh, things you think that, that we need to be more cautious about? I mean, you're, you're raising a lot of sort of red flags on a lot of the surveillance technology um, we've talked about, you know, big data as it relates to the financial model. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other things that you feel like just don't get nearly enough airtime in terms of the, the maybe the, even the existential threat that they pose to, to people? Yeah, I mean, oh gosh. I mean, you know, I, like, I, I feel like we're, we're, you know, sort of the, the um, two sides of the coin because, <laughs> I mean, in, in as much as I, I think I have a job, you know, sort of um, that is not teaching, um, you know, that's not my, not my normal job. It's to point out that these things are terrible. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but I, I think one of the things, if I can find, um, some optimism, right, is the notion that, um, before that, that is becoming more real, which is that we really need to think about the effects of these things or potential, um, so, oh gosh, and I could, I wish I could remember this person's name. I know them from Twitter, but they talk, they do a lot of speculative work. I think it's Casey, um, does a lot of speculative work with technology. Like what are the potential harms of this thing? Uh -huh. Like before you put it out, right? So right. To, when, when Zoom came out and said, we had no idea that people would use it to, um, spread racism and, and, um, you know, misogyny. Right? Child pornography. Like, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like they could they could have done that work. Right. Right. And I think one of the things I've, I've, I've seen that does give me a little bit of hope is there are more and more people not only saying that we have to do that work, but be being in, inside these companies and holding them accountable for yes. doing it. You know, not after the harm is done. Right. Not after the toxins been released, but before it, it's released. 
Yeah, um, great, great summation statement, I think, honestly, because it seems like people are always looking for, you know, what's the practical thing that what can I take back to the work that we're doing in my company? What can I take back, you know, to, to how I'm practicing, you know, uh, technology and developing technology? And it does seem like that that is the thing, right? Like, we need to have more of a, a robust work for examining what we're building for the the downstream consequences like how this is going to play at scale as you say like that's where the problems creep up is at scale yeah wonderful yeah kim creighton i don't know if yeah. you know her but she's got Dude. like these four principles and again like i i would i i feel like i know them by heart but now that i'm under pressure i can't i can't name them tech is not but, neutral right, yeah that's lack one of inclusion for sure. is a is a is a risk um oh gosh um but <laughs> How I Sorry, that. Kim. We should have these committed yeah. to memory. Oh, yeah, she's get me. <laughs> <laughs> but here's Life a good opportunity to plug. She man. does yeah. great anti-racist workshops virtually. She did one. I I did it a bit ago. Everyone else, look for Kim Creighton and sign up for those because it's super important that we're having a shared vocabulary and understanding about what it is we're talking about when we talk about anti-racism and how to build, you know, better technologies and make sure we're we're keeping as much of the, the racism and other uh, problems out of, of our technology. So yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. So I'm glad you it's gave us a chance to give Kim a is shout our out. risk management something. But <laughs> basically, to sum it up really quickly, what, how I take that is that if Zoom had had people, you know, um, if they had had a better set of folks working on these things, they wouldn't have to later on say, we didn't know people were going to do X, right? Because black folks know, right? Black women know this. Like, marginalized populations know that these things are going to happen. Yeah. Um, and so it's not just like we want diversity numbers so we can have better diversity numbers. Right. Like, you know, um, there's ways that it's going to make the company work better. Right. And or these the people who are recognizing the potential problems are not being listened to in the organization. Right. So that's a that's a, a note to take back to yeah. the organization, too. Right. Like, listen, yeah. when people surface the issues and become huge. So, yeah, exactly. I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I hope everyone who's uh, tuned in has gotten a lot out of it. Uh, Chris, where can people find you online and follow your uh, your wonderful wisdom? Uh, well, I, I spend entirely too much time on Twitter um, <laughs> as hyper visible. Uh, I occasionally write. Uh, as you said, I had a, a recent piece in Medium. Um, and uh, oh, that, that's it. Yeah, you, if they just follow you on Twitter, that you linked to that Medium piece right from there too, right? So. Yeah, yeah, it's my it's my pinned tweet right now. All right. And uh, just one last little note here that I see in comments. It says Kate's mom is watching. So hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being in the audience. Uh, it's wonderful, I, Chris. I cannot thank you enough for being part of of my little experiment here, and and finally getting a chance. I think for for us to have this conversation, you know, face to face, quote unquote. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me. My pleasure. And uh, we'll, I think we'll do this again. I, I would love to have you back on sometime in, in the future. And uh, if everybody has any uh, comments or, or any questions, feel free to follow up with me or with Chris. I'm Kate O on Twitter, uh, hypervisible. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, next time. Next week, we'll be back. And I hope to see you then. Bye-bye.